All right. So for all the members that are uh, logged in and watching, this is our first segment of our Sheep Camp series, uh, which is, um, this is night one. We're going to have uh, three nights this week. And then part two is going to uh, go live July 11, 12, and 13. And we were just still working on finalizing our guests for that, uh, for that week's segments. So for tonight, we're very excited to have two very special guests on uh, our first episode of uh, Sheep Camp. So we've got uh, Mr. Bill Jex, who's the Provincial Wild Sheep and Mountain Goat Specialist. I love that title, Bill. I don't, I don't know too many people that got that specialist title, so that's really good. Thank you. Uh, and we've got uh, Wild Sheep Society of BC CEO, Kyle Stelter. Welcome, Kyle. Nice to see you again. So uh, first of all, I just want to thank both of you guys for taking the time out of your schedules to participate in this. As we all know, Spike Camp is a, a very new platform. This is our first real um, attempt, like hopefully a successful attempt at a live video event. And also for the listeners, uh, we're going to be recording this and it'll be saved on the platform and quite possibly could be flipped onto a podcast form, either for Kyle's podcast or one that we're going to do. So um, I guess without further ado, we would like to uh, welcome Bill. Bill's got a presentation for us and uh, we'll just let you roll with it. So Bill's going to share his screen and I think Kyle is going to be his wingman for part of it. So let's go and we'll save our questions. If you, I guess for the guests that are online, if you want to ask questions, you can type them uh, as the uh, presentation is rolling and we'll try to get to them at the, uh, at the end of the session. So I'm going to mute my mic and let you guys go. Excellent. Thanks. I think um, rather than putting it in presentation mode, I'm going to leave it like this. I'm not too worried about people seeing the next slide that's in the queue. Um, and I just, it's a little bit easier to navigate on my end because I am not that technologically savvy and this looks good like this so I can we can manage this part um, uh, just to for, add this, uh, yeah sorry Bill I was just gonna say we'll um, you know we'll try and um, make sure that this uh, this slideshow goes into our hunter resources section too so it'll be available if guys want to you know, log on and check it out so don't don't worry too much about the detail thanks okay. no sounds good Thanks for the invite. I am very happy that Kyle's here, sort of, uh, as you said, Chuck, acting as wingman tonight and maybe uh, um, sort of helping me with some of the conversation. Uh, Kyle, thanks for coming and making the time because you're um, you've got much more experience at, at this type of outreach than I do. So I, I'm going to sort of rely on you to keep me on the straight and narrow. And if I stray too much or, or get stuck on a point, Give me a prod for sure. Sounds great, Bill. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, it, you know, this kind of started, I'll just do a real quick um, idea of how we got here. Uh, you know, last November, the BC Wild Sheep Society hosted the BC Sheep Summit. And out of that um, few days of uh, a huge number of people coming together on behalf of sheep and really sort of developing kind of a strategic action plan, if you want to, for lack of a better description, it, it was really detailed, um, really important piece of material to come out to benefit sort of planning and, and uh, conversations around sheep. And this then sort of led to a conversation with Chuck and Blake and, and of course, Kyle and myself about next steps and where did we see needs for more information. And we've been doing the horn aging uh, workshops with Wild Sheep Society, myself and other bios have been involved with that. Um, and certainly down at Wild Sheep Society's convention in the spring, we usually have the regional biologists doing presentations to give members and attendees sort of a snapshot of where sheep are in their regions and, and uh, highlight any issues or ongoing concerns or maybe some bright points as well. So, you know, it was kind of the culmination of that bit of momentum that got us to this point. And for me, um, kind of where I sit, I'm the first sort of person to be handed this title of 
uh, managing both wild sheep and mountain goats in the in the province. Uh, it's a little bit overwhelming, a little bit daunting for sure, uh, which is why I rely on folks like people that are uh, helping me present this tonight for sure. Um, but back to the summit, you know, one of the things that came out of that, there were a lot of good discussions around regulation and regulation reform and policy reforms and that sort of thing. Um, because I think for the most part, people recognize that uh, status quo is kind of a product of 1982. And are we in the same type of um, landscape and hunterscape today as we were in 1982? And we probably would all agree that we're not. I look at certainly the mountain athletes that are sheep hunters now compared to the days when I first started. Um, night and day in terms of fitness and ability and technology supports and that sort of thing. So I think tonight I just like I only have a few slides to go over. I kind of wanted to offer people a bit of an idea of what do we consider when we when we start crafting ideas or policies or regulations on hunting sheep. And again, my purpose here is selfish. I want people to go away from this or during this session ask questions. I want people to turn their minds to new opportunities or new options or, um, and, you know, similar to what the Wild Sheep Society did with the uh, summit compendium document, list out strategies that they'd like to, you know, kick around a bit. Will this work? If we do A, will it generate, you know, outcome B that we want to see? Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll dive right in here just... Um, you know, in BC, we talk, especially uh, when it comes to stone sheep, because it's there's still predominantly general open season harvest. Uh, we have um, very selective based regulations, so sex selection as well as as age driven, and uh, there's a reason for that. They can be the most conservative type of regulation you can employ. That doesn't affect opportunity so without going to a draw or some other um, lottery or competitive system um, and and why do we want to you know you've heard if you've heard me talk before and certainly uh, I've heard Kyle kind of describe this as well that we'd like to see um, harvest of predominantly older rams and we might ask well why would that be right because those are your big breeding males well you know as we get older um, we start to become a little bit senescent is what it's called. And it just means that you become a little bit less active in the rut. And that's the case with wild sheep as they get older, you know, rams are not quite as active in the rut. They still participate, but you know, by the time they get to be very old rams, um, they're not very active at all. So they don't generally uh, contribute a lot to the population stability from a biological sense. Um, you know, young rams, we want to be cautious a little bit about harvesting those young rams that have not yet had an opportunity to breed because if you crop them off before they have an opportunity to reproduce, then you lose their genetic soup. Sure, it's carried in the rest of the family that, that, uh, and relatives that they have, but their specific um, genetic recipe is lost. So we want a regulation that allows those young rams to recruit, to become to the point where they can uh, reproduce at least once, twice, preferably, um, and, and contribute that way. So it really is that genetic diversity that is the one of the drivers right next to opportunity in terms of how we've structured our regulations here in BC. So, um, you know, we harvest older rams, full curl in, in BC. We're talking about thin horns, it's full curl or seven years old. And we want people to focus harvest on those. So people then become concerned. Well, you say you need mature rams in your population to breed. We know we need seven, eight, nine year olds, 10 year olds to breed. Um, but that's what you're telling us to shoot. So there's a bit of a disconnect in the message there. And at face value, you're absolutely right. 
But the way that we want to structure our harvest and the way that we try to plan our harvest, even through a general open season opportunity, is to effectively see about 3% of those um, rams become part of that harvest. So we pull from the science part to inform what we put out on the ground. And, you know, I've got a couple um, people that are looking at the screen here. You know, there's a couple things that the research generally agrees on. One is that selective harvest pressure can have a negative impact on populations where harvest pressure is too high. So it's fine to select. It's fine to have a harvest structure built on selection. The kicker is the degree of harvest pressure. And so my colleagues from around uh, Western North America, from Mexico to Alaska, part of a wild sheep uh, working group, and we've compared these notes. We've, we've asked each other about their recipes for managing uh, harvest and age demographics and um, you know, draw versus open tag versus open season, that sort of thing. And we all landed in around that 3%. When we, when we run the numbers, 3% is, is kind of the, the comfortable place to be um, because it's precautionary, but also creates quite a bit of opportunity. In a general, and you know, I've got some uh, citations there. Again, the bulk of the literature agrees on those two points. So it's not just as simple as one ram and one ewe equals three sheep on the mountain. It's, it's more subtle than that. And anybody who's watched, you know, rams competing for the opportunity to breed understands there's a lot more at play than just having one male and one female. Um, there's things like you preference, you know, ewes will prefer certain males that have proven that they're fit and they prove they're fit through combat and through stature and, and through the way that they um, undertake the courtship displays. Uh, you know, there's all those nuances that come into play uh, that help create your population. And that's sort of described like through demographics and composition. If we can manage within our herds or we monitor our demographics and our composition within our herds and populations, then that gives us an idea whether or not our harvest pressure is too high. And so I'm going to try and bring things back to that harvest pressure conversation because every regulation really is a means to manage harvest pressure. Um, Sure, at the end of the day, that makes a difference on the number of animals that are harvested, but it's more around the pressure that's put on the population through that harvest. So we set minimum populations in BC to act as guidance. We've pulled those numbers from the literature and some of that literature is evolving. We're developing it here in BC as well as in Alaska. Um, for currently for bighorn sheep populations, we've identified that um, and there's, there's been a little bit of research to support that populations of less than 75 animals probably should not be subject to harvest. Just because you, you run into um, the potential for uh, affecting the recruitment, the biology part of, um, of the population. Thin horns, uh, it is currently set at 75, but the northern regions that have thin orange sheep now are, are actively talking about a need to move that to 100, especially in light of climate change and some of the annual uh, impacts that we see in populations a few years back here, well, actually just a couple years, not, not a few. Um, some of our populations declined by 50% because we had a really nasty set of uh, winter weather come through. Alaska, same thing. Uh, um, Almost a decade ago, in the Western Brooks, they predicted they lost well over half of their population. And again, recently, the same weather system that impacted us affected Alaska, and they also saw a significant um, decrease in their population. So we think that by being a little bit more conservative, by 
using that 100 number instead of 75, um, we won't have a situation where hunters going out on the landscape to harvest rams would become an additive um, population pressure or a mortality factor. And that's, you know, we always, part of what I do in my job is to make sure that we can always demonstrate that hunting and harvest is uh, sustainable and defendable. Um, you might, you know, we, we sit in a, some of our, our insulated conversations here and we don't understand that there are people with different views and there are different pressures and questions that gets posed to governments. And part of what I do is provide the, um, some of the response material associated with that. So, you know, if we can always um, have a situation where our hunting, we can prove that it's sustainable, uh, we can prove that we've we've uh, incorporated new science as it evolves, and we're being current with the way we manage. I think we then we're always able to pass those sort of challenges or tests. Back to the um, three percent conversation. You know, most populations have between eight and fifteen percent will be mature or full curl rams. That's a general range you know some populations are a little bit more or a little bit less than that but in general and that extends again it's a conversation that's come out of that western north america group of um jurisdictional species leads uh, remarkably consistent that sort of range so if you think that we're taking a three percent harvest rate and you know we would still be reducing potentially reducing that eight percent down to five or 15 down to 12, which still leaves us a really good proportion of mature um, uh, or full curl rams out on the landscape. Again, it's part of that precautionary approach to make sure that we don't over harvest um, from a demographic group and cause population issues later. That's kind of where we are with the, the policy and procedure parts of our um, regulations. It wants to, we want to fit them into those general rule groups. Um, and you know, this, this information has remained pretty consistent. There's a lot of new information in sheep research and hunter uh, research, but that part of the, the sheep information, you know, Geist, when he did his studies, uh, effectively godfathered that those parameters and since that time the group of successive management biologists people that came ahead of me and now that are my my uh, colleagues we've kind of proven that out and we're pretty comfortable with those general parameters um, the way that uh, Geist introduced them years ago so now we know that if we can manage the, the baseline, we, we can manage the amount of harvest that we do, we can orient the harvest in a, in a selective way, with, then we can be sustainable, but back to the harvest pressure. So we also need to be able to manage harvest pressure now. So we've got a really good um, framework set up but the wild card to that is the harvest pressure part. Um, so what do we do to uh, uh, manage for harvest pressure? Well, we establish conservative regulations like a full curl thin horn regulation. Um, uh, that, that's a conservative five point bull caribou, another conservative regulation. So we use those sorts of regulations to um, help it being uh, more conservative and manage harvest pressure on sort of that reproductive cohort, that reproductive engine in our populations. Um, of course, we set policies and procedures and those minimum population numbers that I showed earlier, they come from our harvest management procedures. So, um, you know, that's an example of, of that part of a tool that we use. Uh, we define and we continue to adapt um, hunt units. So trying to understand what is a meaningful population. Uh, recent, you know, in the past, it's always been WMUs or MUs, if, if you like that. 
uh, term better. Guide outfitter territories been another one. Uh, in some areas of the province where they have the good fortune of having a lot of um, data related to movements and uh, genetic exchange and herd boundaries and landscape fracture zones and that sort of stuff, um, they've actually established what we call population management units. And so they're discrete units and they could include one or more management, uh, wildlife management units or one or more guide outfitted territories. But the idea is to um, be able to identify what group of animals is being subjected to a specific harvest effort. And, um, you know, there's a bunch of other geographies. We just um, finished pulling together the thin horn sheep framework. We're still sort of incorporating some uh, last minute edits that we got from the society and from GOABC and Wildlife Fed and others. Um, but, you know, there's other areas that we try to show there as well that are relevant, like the genetic subpopulations. Um, we know that uh, groups of sheep that are closely related genetically have regular genetic exchange. And that can happen a couple different ways when it comes to sheep in terms of behavior. So um, we have to be sure that we know what pathway is, is um, resulting in that similar genetic makeup. Uh, but, you know, that's another tool that we can look at as an umbrella thing, certainly from habitat enhancement stuff. If you look at the um, society's efforts to uh, undertake habitat enhancement, they're not looking at a herd level um, for the most part. They're not looking at a herd level type of habitat um, uh, work. They're looking at a larger population area. And we'll, for thin horned sheep, we probably need to think in terms of some of those larger geographic envelopes to make sure that the population um, intervention is positive in a in a in a good geography sort of thing in a, in a decent size. And then at the fine details, you know, we manage through um, harvest quotas for guide outfitters or allocations in areas where there's LEH zones. Those are allocated hunt areas as well. So we really um, drill down where we need to because of either conservation risk or um, some other factor that um, is driving decision making. So, uh, you know, a number of parks in the Northwest that manage multiple um, user values are LEH zones. So it's great. We can we still have opportunities to hunt in um, provincial park, but it's it's you know, considers the fact that there are other user groups out there that are not um, on the ground uh, for hunting purposes. So all that said, all that background, that baseline, you know, we've got a bit of a foundation. We've got policy and procedures that help guide us. We look at biology. We compare across jurisdictions. We try to incorporate research as it comes. Um, to make sure that our decisions are well formed, but the part that that falls to the audience tonight, you know, to the members of Wild Sheep Society and the Wildlife Fed and TOABC, and certainly the members of Spike Camp, um, it really is is sort of speaks through this slide. Um, if we take a look at the provincial population estimates. Uh, upper right corner of this slide, you'll get a look at the bighorn ones. We've been collecting them since the since 1970. The concept there was every three to five years for regional biologists who were the regional experts, really, put their heads together and try to come up with a regional population estimate for California's, Rockies, Stones, and Dolls. And, um, you know, back in 1970, it was all fixed wing um, inventory work. So there was a lot of uh, um, probably missed sheep. The sightability that you would use on a fixed wing survey is quite a bit higher than the helicopter survey. Um, just our understanding of being able to, to find scale inventory areas, it's all sort of really changed. And then for my time, it was really the 90s. Um, late 80s, early 90s, when helicopters arrived on the scene, became a tool that we could use. So when we, you look at those population graphs, keep 
that in mind a little bit. Don't get too excited about the 1970 numbers. Um, I included them because I didn't want to not include them. They were the best guests of the day by the biologists of the day and were a product of the tools they had to work with. But as you start to move into the 90s, you start to see a little bit more confident um, uh, estimates because you know people are counting sheep out of helicopters instead of um, flying over top of mountains in a fixed wing. The trends, though, are similar between thin horns and big horns. If you look at those graphs, um, it recognize the scale is different on the left. So the thin horn graph looks a little bit flatter than the big horn one does. But um, generally, the trend is very similar, right? We started in the mid 90s. It appeared populations were fairly robust across the province in terms of both big horn and, and thin horn. And then we saw a decline through to 2004. Um, the interesting thing here is that other species in BC uh, follow that same decline. 2004 seemingly being a year where moose and caribou and sheep and goats um, all struggled. So anybody interested in doing a master's project to figure out why that is, um, probably climate-based, that would be a, a pretty cool um, opportunity there for sure. But, you know, we get back to the numbers. Or we, we do see in recent years a declining trend again. Part of that is those examples that I offered earlier, those severe winter weathers that caused high mortality, um, some disease event, new things like um, blue tongue and seropties that are hitting in the Okanagan, um, those the die-offs that happened in the 80s um, through disease, and then some later ones in other parts of the province that affected some of those trends as well on a finer level scale. So, you know, it, it's not one thing; it's a series of things. And um, you know, again, when we manage populations and we manage regulations and we try to create hunter opportunity those are all things that sort of are part of the calculation in the background this probably the most interesting graph here is the one on the left um, you know you take a look at the uh, number of total number of sheep licenses sold through the years uh, and this only goes back to 0506 so um, you can compare that to what you're seeing on those population graphs. But different than the population graphs, you know, we, we've continued to see an increase in interest in um, mountain sheep, which is, for me, it's great, but it is um, a little bit scary at the same time. Uh, it, and that's why, you know, that's why I'm here tonight, hat in hand, asking for people to come together and have a conversation about what do we want to see and what do we want from our sheep populations going forward? Um, you can appreciate if you plot these trends out, the increased interest versus declining population, um, those aren't trajectories that are sustainable. So um, I, I'd much sooner see um, us talking about sort of a more fulsome um, set of tools than, than just um talking about hunting or just talking about population or just talking about regulation or just talking about policy that sort of thing i did gray out the 22 23 bar just because there could be some data missing um you know covid year was uh, a really interesting year when we plot the harvest and uh it, i think you know some jurisdictions have studied this a little bit more in depth and we've been able to here in bc but certainly a couple of jurisdictions in the lower 48 have identified there's a bit of a latent COVID effect. And um, I, you know, I grade that bar out just so that people would know that it's different and I'm a little bit uh, uh, less confident in that one being uh, shown at that level. This year coming up will be informative. That'll help me understand whether or not I color that bar blue the same as the other ones or if I leave it gray. So. Um, and that's just the world shut down. So 
you know, we have to manage those sorts of things and, and understand the data that comes in our systems can be influenced by that. And now to the thing that um, I am a super huge fan of, the society pulling together the Sheep Summit, the compendium document. Um, and in that the conversation around potential uh, hunting pressures and harvest strategies. So this is hopefully, you know, information. I, I am open to chat with anybody if you want to send email or you want to work through the society or you want to work through site camp or whatever. Um, you know, be creative, bring out some ideas. Um, don't get stuck in status quo, I guess, is what I'm trying to offer. I'll give you an example of that. Um, something that I hear quite often is uh, easy fix the thin horns. Go to a one and three or two and five. Um, solve all your problems. Oh, well, you know, we've crunched that number, crunched those numbers a couple times. Um, when I did that, but reality is changing. I will admit that. I am not um, comfortable just saying, well, we looked at it once and it's always going to be that way. Um, in 2018, when I did that as analysis for the society, it made the difference. So the one in the, it was actually a two in five analysis that I did at that time. Number of hunters that shot two sheep in a five year period. And it made the difference of uh, if we would have had that one in three rule or two in five rule, it made the difference of six sheep in Skeena per year. Um, for the piece, it was around a dozen. So all told, we were looking at anywhere between 15 and 18 sheep um, per year if we had that um, regulation in place. The, um, you know, so you start to look at the amount of effort um, that goes into crafting a regulation and to get a solution that maybe isn't going to yield a lot of positive outcomes because buried in those numbers are the hunters that got an LEH for doll sheep or bighorn and shot one of those. And that's one of the two sheep that they took in their five year period. Um, buried in that is a hunter that hunted in region six one year, in region seven, a different year, and took a ram in both regions. So just because of the way our data, our biometrics division is undergoing a huge uh, software platform overhaul, our old platforms really limited what we could do with our data. And that has affected sort of some of those wrap ups, but we know that those examples of situations existed. Um, but going forward, we should. With the new system, it's a lot more um, uh, has a lot more fidelity in terms of really drilling down to key pieces of data and comparisons. So, going forward, we'll be better set. We'll have better information. We'll be more confident in those. But I just want to, you know, just mention that those um, uh, five and six rams per year or a dozen rams per year included those other hunters and um so they do exist out there those are those so the question then that i have is if you go forward with a one and three or two and five is your intended objective to tell the person who got a doll sheep draw one year that they can't hunt sheep anywhere else or they can't hunt stone sheep so as we as you all pull together your, your thoughts on different regulations, think downstream, think about the implications of, okay, if we're gonna implement this, um, you know, who should be included in this group, who shouldn't be included in this group, what's the real intention of the objective? So uh, I left that there. I can leave this slide up if you, if you like. That's, that's pretty much the end of my, um, presentation. Uh, I'm hoping Kyle can, you know, share some wisdom on, um, you know, what they've learned as a as an organization coming out of the summit, and um, 
and yeah, I'll just open it up to the floor. Well, thanks, Bill. That's a great presentation. Um, Kyle, would you like to add anything to that as far as the Sheep Summit goes and your thoughts? Yeah, sure, Chuck. Um, yeah, thanks, Bill, for, for the presentation. And, uh, you know, this is something that uh, at a director's level, we've been talking at the society for a few years now about, um, uh, you know, how do we manage this aspect of, uh, you know, I guess increasing hunters on the landscape, decreasing sheep numbers. And uh, as we know, in lots of cases, you know, hunter harvest is not the issue, right? Um, so, um, but that doesn't change our mandate of looking after BC's wild sheep. Uh, you know, we have to put the, the resource first, look after wild sheep first and, um, and manage appropriately. So, you know, if there's a large scale die off, whether it be climate change, you know, rough winter disease, doesn't really matter. We're not going to, you know, hunt sheep to extinction. So that's one of the things that we've been talking about. And, you know, we're seeing numbers, um, with a pretty good level of confidence coming out, you know, where there's decreases, there's increased hunting, hunter harvest. So, you know, we've been looking at ways to be proactive. Um, you know, one of the things that was a bit of a sore spot for us last year was the Kootenai region and uh, we went to LEH there. So, you know, we we're trying to look at lots of solutions, you know, to, to keep opportunity open for, for sheep hunters. Um, and, you know, again, our concern was just what can we do to help the resource so that everyone can be out there and, and sheep hunting. So, um, you know, I guess that's the, the key takeaway. Our job is to look after wild sheep uh, as the society. Um, and we are, a, a, without question, a member driven organization. And we listen to our membership with uh, the Region 4 stuff. We listen, we, we put out a survey. Uh, I don't have the stats in front of me. I should have pulled them up, but we had hundreds of responses i think there were 700 responses we received uh regarding how to manage region four and the leh um and there was quite a bit of effort put into that and and what we should do and and what what, what to advocate for um and one of the things that we felt was there was just a little bit it was a little too late to do what we needed and then we ended up on leh so you know kind of the thing that we've been thinking about as a society and talking a lot about uh at our at the board level is it, are there things we can do now, steps that we can do now that are going to sort of, uh, you know, prevent LEH going to a full draw? Uh, nobody wants that, I don't think, as a general rule. So what are the things that we can do? Um, and as Bill mentioned, we had a sheep summit that we hosted in November of 2022 in Prince George. Uh, we brought together about 100 stake and title holders. Um, we had guide outfitters, resident hunters. Uh, lots of fish and game organizations bc wildlife was represented there the federation um uh and first nations were involved as well government and uh, it was a very wholesome group a very good representation of different user groups across the landscape um, some industry academia and um and we had a lot of dialogue and we broke it down provincially and then we looked at each region as well and that outcome statement came out. It's on our website. You can go to wildsheepsociety.com forward slash BC Summit. And that entire document or compendium, as Bill referred to it, is on the site. It's 40 pages. Uh, we spent three days working through that. And it, was, it wasn't it was just the society sitting there saying, hey, this is what we think. We, we consulted with the users on the landscape stake and title holders to get their input and sort of see what, what they felt. And one of the things that was discussed there was harvest pressure and, and how do we do, what do we do to manage it? And of course, there's a whole diverse range of thoughts on that. But one thing about it, the society, whatever we advocate for, um, the one thing I will say is conservation first. Um, I don't think there's any question that's our mandate. So we follow that and we're member driven. So we're going to listen to our membership. And if our membership tells us they want us to push for something, we'll, we'll advocate for it. Um, you know, we do work closely with the provincial government where we can um, to support them, um, to find strategies and, and work effectively with them. Um, and I guess that was one of the things that Bill, you know, approached the society and asked us to be here tonight um, and really looking towards our membership for, for some feedback and some thoughts. You'll have seen Bill's slideshow there and there was a number of uh, recommendations that came out of that. So we talked one and three, one and five and, and a whole bunch of other things. And kind of the worst case scenario, I guess the worst case scenario would be a full closure, but one step back from that would be a limited entry hunter draw of some in some capacities. So 
that's kind of where we're sitting now as a society. Um, obviously, we want everyone to get out there and, and get after sheep and enjoy it. Uh, but I guess sustain, sustainability is the key takeaway there. So it's kind of the uh, 40,000 foot view from my perspective. So happy to take some questions if anyone has any. Yeah, great. Thanks, Kyle. I see uh, Blake put up the link in the chat, uh, which we'll also put up on the platform under Hunter Resources for the uh, for the summit from last year. Um, <clears throat> question uh, that comes to mind for me is, uh, how are we doing as far as harvest rates go? You, you mentioned the 3 percent is the target number. Uh, can you just share what, I, I might have missed it, I apologize if I did, but uh, what, what is our actual harvest rate uh, look like provincially and then by region in particular with stone sheep over say the last three or four years? Yeah, so you know BC's done fairly well. Um, overall we're in around I think it's about 2.6 or 2.8 percent harvest rate so we're still under our three percent. Um, you know the provincial numbers um, as you drill down it becomes a little bit different right there's all kinds of regional variation there. In terms of stone sheep uh, across the north area, you know, we're still right in around that 2.8, 2.7% harvest rate. Um, but as anybody who's attended a couple areas, there are a couple of MUs that have significant harvest pressure and they're up around 6 and 7%. So, um, you know, as you drill down to uh, wildlife management unit level, um, sometimes uh, the news isn't so great and you know the solution is dilution right go to the provincial level and we're golden so it, it is um one of the nice things again the way that the society structured the outcome of the summit is by region so there is a list of um issues that are sort of forefront in people's minds in each region and and so what you'll see is some regions include those a little bit uh, in terms of priority ranking. The uh, if we look at bighorns, you know the there's that external factor. There's blue tongue we had a couple of years ago. There's Seropthes now that's on both sides of the valley. There's um, Movi that's predominantly still in the central part. We we're lucky we've not had that in the East Kootenays, but back in the 80s, there was a die off in the in the Kootenays. So it can happen. It's something that um, definitely affects populations. You certainly have road kills and vehicle impacts that are happening in the in the Kootenays. So as Kyle touched on, it's not always hunting um, uh, harvest or hunting pressure per se that is the factor, but um, it, it we don't want hunting to ever be seen as a contributing factor to a population tanking, right? So that's why we're we, um, certainly in the new uh, way that government wants to roll things out, regional wildlife advisory committees when they get up and running. Um, currently some regions have hunting and trapping and fishing advisory committees now, so they're they're somewhat effective the way they are, but um, it's that is the venue and the place to have those regional discussions because uh, you, you know different herds, different populations in the Kootenays um, were in different realities, and in some of them, uh, you know, every legal ram uh, had been killed in some years. So that's not where we want to be, right? We want to be in around that three percent. Um, uh, range at the population level too, and it doesn't always happen. So, yeah, I guess that's a long-winded way of saying that you know at the provincial level we're not too bad, but there's a couple sore spots in in the province, and I think if we can be proactive at putting our minds together and the type of change we'd like to see, we won't be forced into a change like everybody kind of was um, not too long ago, right? So, you know, the the tools are are whatever people want to make of them, whether you want to change um, legal definitions, whether you want to change season lengths, whether you want to change um, uh, things like point systems or demerit point systems or um, a combination of splitting the tag, you know, you harvest one one year and, you know, the other another year, that sort of 
conversation is all the different variations of that that can happen. Um, you know, currently we only have one archery zone for sheep in BC, and that's the Tautigan. Uh, back 25 years ago, you know, as a bull hunter myself, you could walk around Tautigan and, and it was pretty quiet. You didn't see. I think the first time I went to Tautigan was about 1999. Myself and a friend went there and um, we saw one other pair of hunters and that was all we saw for the week we spent there. Um, today, I don't think you would, well, the number of people that call me after they go hunting there, um, I, I don't think that's the reality it is there today. So, you know, part of a tool might not be closing hunting. It might be creating more of similar opportunity somewhere else. And so, um, you know, with archery, it's a different type of lethality in in the sense. So in terms of hunter success, it's a different type of hunt. You've got to get in close. It's, there's no long range aspect to it, really. So where we have some of these um, really localized areas where we have a really high harvest rate now, is that an opportunity to tweak it, create a new opportunity, diffuse the pressure and taught again? Um, but also then address the harvest pressure at a local scale in some of these source point, point areas. So, but again, it's a, it, you know, I don't have all the answers. That's why I'm here and trying to, you know, you all can, can help me understand that better than any. And, and certainly the society with the platform they have with their AGMs and their outreach that they do, you know, they're, to me, they're the natural leaders in, in this house. Certainly I rely a lot on Kyle, um, to sort of test and engage on parts of that and then give me some wisdom on, you know, input and advice, but yeah. So Bill, a couple of questions come to mind again. I got, I just got a text from uh, one of our members here sort of direct to me, uh, just asking what kind of advice do you have for, or Kyle, I guess as well, or both of you, what advice would you guys have or just a you know regular hunter in the field how can they be proactive with regards to you know these changes like as far as our input whether it's in the field or through the society uh, i mean when you look at the uh i'm just going to add some to the to the user's question but if you look at some of the examples of the strategies uh like two and five or one and five or leh or you know two and you're done for life or what, or, you know, what have you, what, um, I guess, what do you think works or what have you seen from other states or territories or provinces? Uh, there's, you know, as far as things like that initiatives that they've tried that may work again, what can, the, what can we do as hunters to, to be involved in this process? I think as Kyle indicated, you know, with the, uh, with the closure in the Kootenays, and going straight to LEH, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, we don't, I don't think we want to see that process go as quickly as that one did. Uh, hopefully, you know, I, I can't see us going out this year and killing every legal ram in, in, as far as stone sheep goes. So that's probably not going to happen like that. But just your thoughts on that, please. Do you want to start, Kyle, or do you want me to dive in? Yeah, you're probably more qualified, uh, Bill, for sure. Um, yeah, I've got some thoughts, but I'll you go ahead first, and I'm sure you've thought of them much more robustly than I have. Yeah, so, you know, back to the, I'll just make sure I have the question, you know, what what can people do to make sure that they're making the right choice? Is that the best way to, to sum that up, Chuck, or what? Did I miss part of that? Yeah, exactly. Let, we'll start with that. We can kind of unpack it as we go, I think. So, uh, you know, I guess... Um, you know, to, to say the same thing I say a lot is the, make sure it's full curl for, in terms of thin horn, make sure it's full curl by horn before you look any closer, right? Um, uh, you know, don't get in a spot in terms of compliance where you walk up and you've got horn shrinkage and, and you're in a bad spot. So, um, but at the same time, I had a call just a couple of weeks ago from a guy who was, uh, really sort of beating himself up because he's like, well, I'm still less than one club. I still haven't taken a ram. And I'm looking at these rams that I know are eight or nine years old. I'm confident in that. Um, or they're, you know, they're just right at the nose and it's just not the type of ram that I think I want to harvest. It's their personal decision, right? 
And my response was, well, don't beat yourself up, right? They, um, a legal ram is a, is a legal ram. And, f- and it's an accomplishment. It's a moment of, I've not yet taken a ram. I'm sort of in that same boat where I'm watching and waiting for the right opportunity and the right circumstance. But, um, you know, the regulations are there to provide opportunity. Uh, really, the danger comes um, from sort of repeated pressure on those recruiting rams. So, you know, you're successful, you harvest your first ram. Well, don't be looking for a squeaker seven year old from that, you know, from that point on. You should be looking for something a little bit different, a little bit higher quality. And I think if people do that by and large, we've, it, it, moderates the effect that that increasing attendance of hunters there are right we're 3,000 3,200 licenses sold now um there's only a few hundred of those that are that really would go to bighorn so um you know the bulk of people are hunting big one sheep in bc so if everybody's making sort of precautionary type decisions like that in the field then it's going to help kyle what are your yeah, I pretty much said exactly what I was going to just better. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So guys, as far as, you know, the potential options, if we have to make changes, um, again, I like guess second part of that question was, uh, were, have you seen it work in other states, provinces, territories where they've adjusted, you know, I think Alaska has it, correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, they have it in certain areas, I think. Yeah, there's um well Alaska they 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 have a little bit different. They have if you if there's a broomed uh if the horns are broomed then that ram can be legal. Um Yukon, their line work is a little bit different. Um and but for the most part, the way that hunters are employing the Yukon line work, it ends up with sort of a very similar sort of harvest is what we see here in terms of ages. When you look south of the border um you know you really don't see general open season for sheep their draws some of them are once in a lifetime draws um bc we've become um we've been very fortunate to be able to have uh the high number of just over the counter buy a license go hunting opportunities and you know we don't have the same population in terms of sheep or people that we had um, back in those days and we certainly have seemingly increasing interest and and ability so you know other jurisdictions are already um in that draw reality you get a draw and sometimes it's only once in a lifetime and that's the way that it is so i'd sooner not get there um which is why it's nice to have these conversations now as you said chuck and you know stone sheep we're not we're not at a point where we're have to pull a pin on anything we have we're an opportunity where we can kind of figure things out a little bit right on yeah thank thanks a lot bill so we just had a question come in uh through the chat from one of the members so ken nowicki um asks very often a six or seven year old ram with great genetics is bigger than an 11 year old bracket better trophy and bracket and the present regulations on full curl eight-year-old for thin horns has resulted in a lot of rams confiscated. We need a regulation that prevents this waste and an end to rock piling as well. Even experienced hunters get trapped by the jig definition. Let's think about the Wyoming model. Now, I don't know what the Wyoming model is. Maybe you do, Bill or, or uh, Kyle. What are your thoughts on that? I am not the person to comment on that. What <laughs> once in a life one one a lifetime basically is Wyoming is what it says there. Yeah, yeah, that I, and that's what I said, right? You're, those are the realities in other jurisdictions. It, um, that's not a decision I want to be making because I'm sure there'd be people knocking at my front door saying that they're not very happy about that. But you know, it really is one of those listed items. Um, is there a lifetime maximum on? harvest and um that again that's where i would really like you all to sort of lead those conversations and and because there's it's really about for you 
collecting information. Sorry, I shouldn't presume this. I'm just making the assumption. Um, you're able to collect information in sort of a non-threatening way. If I were to reach out to people and say, hey, you know, I'm thinking about once in a lifetime, people would go ballistic because even if it was just a discussion item, it wouldn't matter. It's the connotation that potentially that's where I'm moving to or recommending um, moving to. So, you know, that's I'm hopeful the community can come together on that. In terms of the comment that was made around the genetics, again, that's part of the reason why we have that full curl by horn or eight years old, because we um, are pretty confident that rams, thin horn rams in BC are gonna start to breed by, you know, the six-year-old rams are gonna start to be involved. The seven-year-old rams are certainly gonna be involved, not to the same degree as eight or nine-year-old rams, but other jurisdictions with thin orange sheep see that sort of trend as well. Um, and it is to protect those genetics. Yeah, we do want to see those genetics as fast horn growing or those rams that grow mass, those genetics sort of carried on through the population. Where we see too high of harvest pressure, um, and you know, back to that earlier slide that I presented where the research all agrees. Uh, the research is pretty consistent on that, that um, when the, the selection pressure is um, focused on one specific group in a population and the harvest pressure is too high, you see genetic effect in horn size. So um, the research is there and everybody agrees um, that, that that is a cause and effect relationship. There's differences in opinion in terms of where that, that um, threshold line is but the general sentiment that harvest pressure creates that outcome um, is unanimous. There's nobody that's arguing that. Um, so I, I hopefully that's hit the, the points. Yeah, I guess there, you know, another question, and I'm sorry, I'm being a little selfish here because a lot of these questions are coming from me and I, I'm in that less than one club and I've been in a scenario where in this case, um, one of my, I guess it was like my second attempt at a, at a sheep hunt. We, we were in a valley, a bowl with a lot of sheep and like over 30 rams, you know, concentrated pockets all around the valley. And uh, the ultimate dilemma came up for me as a, as a new sheep hunter. And that was, you know, the biggest, most mature by physical features ram happened to be a double broomed ram. And I made the choice as a, a newer, sort of a newer sheep hunter to not shoot that ram based on the fact. Yeah, exactly. I knew <laughs> you'd do that. Uh, and I'm just curious what, uh, you know, sort of like the scientific perspective might be on, say, Alaska's rule where, you know, in some cases, a broomed ram is a legal ram. And so that it takes away that, I guess, that risk on the hunter's part. But what would the impact of that rule be here in BC, in your opinion, Bill, if we had, you know, eight years old or broomed, for example, like, like you mentioned earlier that, you know, at, at a certain point, the ram is no longer, an older ram is no longer um, productive in the rut. Um, and I don't, I know that doesn't correlate directly to the fact that his horns might be broomed, but I guess in general, I mean, what, uh, what it, you know, what's the general consensus on that from the scientific perspective? It's not, you know, comparing Alaska to BC is not exactly straight line. It, you know, they've got, geez, what is it, 40,000, 20,000 sheep, no, 40,000 sheep or something like that. I forget the population. It's 20 to 40,000 anyways. You know, we're in the neighborhood of 13,000. So significantly different. Um, we sell last few years over 3,000 licenses. So you got to figure that there's got to be 2,700 sheep hunters looking for thin horn sheep somewhere. And, um, you know, they don't, they don't see anywhere near that amount of harvest pressure in Alaska. They, you know, they, they, they're not even close to that number of people that are participating. So it's a little bit, um, uh, tougher. They can. They they have the freedom because they have such low harvest pressure uh, across their populations to be more liberal with the double brooms um, sort of exemption. In BC, if we were to implement that sort of thing, 
you would have areas where you wouldn't have a huge effect and you'd have other areas where you would have a, a bigger localized effect. So what we see in stone sheep is predominantly they carry their lamb tips until they die. They're, they're um, you know, I've seen 17, 18 year old rams that still have nice, uh, they're, they're worn down a little bit, but their lamb tips are still there. And we see that quite often where we see grooming, um, you know, breakage happens, slip and fall accidents, you'll see a, a ram broken, but where we actually see brooming is usually where we have a, a very high number of young rams doing the breeding. Um, so in region seven, for example, there's a couple areas over there where we have um, a high number of seven-year-old rams in the harvest. We, we have a higher number of young rams that are in the environment, not as many old ones in that group. And it's just a more aggressive style. Those young rams, they, um, they course females, they're, um, they pin and trap uh, breeding type uh, opportunities, um, pursuits until exhaustion sort of thing. Like they're, it's just a very different approach. And that translates into the way that they assert social dominance as well. So, um, you know, for me, in areas where I've seen those pictures of those thin horned rams that have been heavily broomed or busted off, it's usually uh, a symptom of a population, an age representation issue. Um, and so if you were to bring in the double broomed opportunity or exemption, um, you'd just be exacerbating the problem because the ones that are double broomed are the seven year olds that are trying to recruit and they're the oldest ones in the group now. Um, it, it may not work as effectively here as you can make it work in Alaska just because of the real, those sorts of um, harvest pressure, hunter attendance realities. Great answer. Thank you very much. I've been dying to ask somebody that question for a while. Um, as far as the, uh, just back to the, uh, the Wild Sheep Summit uh, from last year, uh, I'm sh again, I wasn't there, so I don't know, but uh, what were the like next steps or action items that came out of that as far as, you know, the, the harvest rates and, and was there a discussion about, you know, looking at surveying out hunters, uh, what our thoughts are on, um, you know, like two and five or LEH, like where did we go from there? Uh, well, I guess let's just start off if you don't mind talk about a little bit about what was discussed and basically um, we created a primer document for the for the event and um, we Bill was very involved um, Helen Swancho was involved um, we reached out for feedback from regional bios in each of the se um, seven regions that hold wild sheep is that the right number it might be off by that but uh, we're every region that had wild sheep we asked the real region regional bios for feedback and we created a primer document and we said anyone that was attending was given that primer document and I think it was about 25 or 30 pages and it was quite comprehensive and it sort of outlined some of the things that the regional bios had seen um, things that Bill and Helen had seen over the years that they were involved with and we said show up with you know having done your homework we expect you to show up know what you're talking about review it and then uh, we did presentations at the start of uh, the event, kind of provincial presentations, and then we ended up broke, breaking up into um, groups. So each region went off on their own. And generally, if, if you're in region six, you would represent region six. So we wanted people that were in region to be commenting on things. So, you know, we had BCWF reps in every group. We had uh, guide outfitter reps in every group. I think we had First Nations representation in every group except for region four. They couldn't make it but they were planning and didn't get there so we had a very diverse group of individuals representing their own region coming up with the primary problems and the solutions and that primer document did outline harvest pressure uh, but what happened when we met was we sort of tasked each group to sort of come up with the primary issues by region so it was a region specific issue and our goal was that the outcomes from this the, the summit would be taken to region 
and would form part of the newly developed together for wildlife regional wildlife advisory committees and they this would be a start for them to work on and say hey this is the problems with wild sheep fix it and we have some recommendations and a whole bunch of stuff and we we've done that so on a provincial basis we didn't really dig down too deeply specifically with harvest pressure we did have six outcomes or six recommendations that we men, met uh, made provincially to the uh, provincial government and that involved the four ministries that were kind of involved with wildlife management and they've all been sent to the ministers it's been sent to the premier um, the ministers of wildlife advisory council has taken that document and made recommendations to the ministry of uh, lwrs so uh, but we didn't really uh spend a bunch of time on harvest pressure region six was the most progressive on it they talked a lot about it and identified some issues and some solutions and some outcomes uh, but the rest of the regions there were bigger fish to fry effectively but on a provincial basis one of the recommendations recommendations that did come out of there was to split the uh big horn and the thin horn tags instead of buying one sheep tag you were going to buy a big horn or a thin horn tag and at the very least it was going to give better data to wildlife managers to know what was going on for who was hunting what and i guess get a better idea of harvest pressure uh, as a minimum so and there's other benefits as well too but that was one of the the ideas so anyway um that the summit what, one of the things a number of the recommendations that came up um uh, or i guess uh suggestions that came up that had been talked about was uh, regulation change, so strict adherence to species harvest management procedures and opportunity based on minimum populations and compositions. So, you know, the 75 unit or 100 unit that Bill talked about earlier. Um, and then uh, limit the number of rams in a lifetime. So one ram every three, five, seven years. Of course, Bill just discussed that and there's some issues with that, right? One in three is not going to have any really meaningful impact. So you know, some of these recommendations are, are not going to solve the problems we need. Uh, we talked about some of the other recommendations was a demerit point system. So if you're harvesting younger rams, you get kind of penalized and you'd be incentivized to, to harvest older rams. For example, another idea that came up was a shared license. So two hunters on a license that allows only one ram harvested. So it would allow people to be still out and enjoying the land on the landscape, still being able to hunt by reducing the, the amount of harvest. So those were some of the ideas, but we never really, region six was the, like I said, the most, I guess, uh, proactive when it came to hunter harvest um, and sort of issues around maybe too much pressure on the landscape. So anyone that's interested can research that. But aside from that, and, and that one recommendation, we talked about splitting the tags, we really didn't come up with any specific recommendations, but we started this conversation. That's why we've agreed to be here today, the society, is to encourage our membership to start thinking about this. What would be acceptable? What are we comfortable with? Would be happy with one ram in a lifetime or two rams or what's that number? What does that look like? Um, or do we do we wanna just hope for the status quo and then deal with the outcomes when it comes to that point where there's too much pressure too, right? So, you know, we wanna be proactive about this. We don't, uh, obviously our, our biggest agenda is to grow more sheep. We want more sheep in the landscape. But when things are beyond our control, how are we going to manage harvest? And a big thing about it, and I guess for any of you individuals that are on here today, I would encourage you to be proactive, reach out to us. And, and you know, we're looking for solutions. And uh, like we did with Region 4, we, we allowed, um, you know, scientific data to help drive where we were going with it and then member recommendations. And then we advocated on your behalf. So we, we kind of took a position and some people didn't like it. Some people felt... You know, we were we weren't following the science as, as you know strictly as they'd like. Other people felt um, you know we needed to be more proactive. You know, there was a whole bunch of nobody was really happy. So, but one thing we will do is allow the our members to be be heard, and we want to hear from you. So, you know, anyone that's a member knows pretty well on how to get a hold of me or any of the directors with the society, and and we're looking ways to be proactive on this and just not not end up in a situation where we're you know. We, we can't go sheep hunting. Nobody can go sheep hunting because we we should have done something earlier on. Well, exactly. And I think, you know, the message to the members and to all sheep hunters would be, you know, we don't want to be passengers on this bus and all of a sudden have a regulation uh, come into play that we didn't have a seat at the table when it came to discussion. So I guess a question I have then is, um, 
you know the you know events like the uh, the sheep summit where there's some discussion points. Um, at what point and how does does change happen if there is going to be change? And I guess that's more of a political question than anything. You know, let's say we do you know wild sheep society pulls the membership, has another sheep summit, comes up with a vote on what changes we think would be acceptable if they were to come down the pipe. But I guess, how does that process work? Uh, or how should it work as far as the government goes in making those decisions? Like, you know, you got the scientific side and then you'll have the public side. I'm just curious what that looks like. Bill, do you, I'll, do you mind if I jump in one more time? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think one of the things that Bill reminds us of is that wildlife managers uh, and you know Bill's not Bill's not the guy that decides you know to close region four right that wasn't Bill's decision Bill provided input and, and advice and suggestions and recommendations and data and science uh, but he Bill wasn't the guy that made that decision uh, but the regional wildlife managers get to a position where they're like okay this is the trigger right and just like species at risk with caribou right the number dropped to a certain number and the federal government came in and it's all over. Okay, go home, kids, take your toys, go away. We need to fix this now. And it's the same for wildlife managers. So they get the data and the data says, okay, and there's certain triggers. And, and when that happens, their hands are tied. So um, we can affect change. Uh, we can go to, uh, the, you know, we sit on the provincial um, hunting and trapping advisory team, the Wild Chief Society BC does. And there's a number of other stakeholders, many members probably are with the BCWF and others uh, that sit on that as well. And we're there for a reason. We provide input. And so if we come in and say, hey, this is what we're thinking we should do. Um, and, you know, we can be proactive in this. So there's an opportunity for that. Uh, we are going to be member driven. We're not going to go out and do something silly that we just, you know, we don't, we always look to our membership for advice. And you know kind of the way i see this playing out is our uh, our convention or is in february in penticton uh, i ins i envision sort of a, a membership opportunity to, to voice their opinions but that said you know this is the starting point we're having these discussions now and we had these discussions immediately after the summit internally um you know what are our next steps what do we want to ad advocate for and a lot of it was um okay we're going to engage with our membership talk to them so this is part of that and we envision probably in February having that dialogue, a more wholesome dialogue again. And then from there, we'll kind of get a direction. And I, I do see a more, I guess, robust survey so that, you know, it's not realistic where we're going to get 1,400 members in a room in Kamloops or Penticton to have a discussion about this. So, you know, we'll, we'll get some direction on where we want to go with it and then pull our membership and then, you know, to, you know, work with the government, be proactive, find ways, solutions, proactive solutions that are meaningful change, right? One in three is going to do nothing. So we're not going to waste our time, money and resources on enacting something that the government is not, it's not going to do anything. We're, we're not going to go there. So we're not interested in trying to reduce people's opportunity. We're trying to prolong them as much as we can be proactive in it. So, you know, the key takeaway for me is reach out, let us be heard. Um, you know, what can we do? You know, what would be acceptable? What are some solutions? And there's some great ideas out there. We, you know, we're, we're looking for solutions on this and reach out to us and, and we'll be engaging more down the road. Oh, exactly. I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's, it's an awareness thing within, uh, you know, hunters in general and, you know, kudos to Bill for, you know, stepping up in front of all of us, you know, like he does so, so often at the shows and, you know, podcasts or interviews like this to to help us, you know, realize that awareness and try to do something. And the fact that he's asking us to think about those solutions is also a good thing. And we need more of that. Um, is there is there plans for another sheep summit? Or is that was that just sort of a one time initial thing and, and see what happens next? Yeah, there certainly is it you know, it was the summit was, in my opinion, a, a great uh, a great meeting of the minds effectively uh, you know lots of times we get together and we have discussions but maybe it's a little lacking on outcomes or directions uh, we did create that outcome document um, after that it was it, it's pretty comprehensive so anyone that is kind of interested in it and seeing you know region by region or provincially and we had some very specific asks of the government the provincial government 
Um, and we've got some really good engagement. And most recently, uh, the Minister's Wildlife Advisory Council, which is led by, um, well, there's a co-chair on it, but Nancy Wilkin recently wrote a letter to uh, the Ministry of uh, LWRS and basically took our six asks from that, our provincial asks, and you know put their spin on it within sort of the context of and confines of what they're able to uh, effectively change and and was very supportive of that document so um, some really good outcomes from that um, and what we're seeing now is it's driving our projects we're getting first nation requests in for example 7a that are saying hey we were at the summit we identified this as the primary issue this is what we're doing and we want money for that project and that's pretty cool because now it's driving our projects. So uh, it was a very successful summit and we certainly do intend to do it again. Uh, part of what we're trying to do now is follow up on it. We had set three month goals, six month goals and one year goals and, and further. And um, so some of those are trying to follow up with that. But again, everybody's capacity limited, but we're trying to use that document and we envision that document being used at, at those RWACs effectively in the future. So. You know, we kind of, we, we pulled individuals and it kind of seemed the sweet spot was a two year time frame for the next one. So not this coming um, November, but it would be November of 25, I guess, uh, no 24. Uh, but one thing that we are doing is we're, right now we're working on putting together a disease symposium in Penticton. So we, we have our show in Penticton um, in February and we're trying to put together, bring in the, the leading disease experts to talk about you know how we can be more proactive in, in um, particularly in the Okanagan where there's a real issue with stropties and, and Moby. So long answer, but there you go. No, that's that's good. It's a great process. And you know, one of the dangers in having regular meetings is you just have regular meetings and you never get anything done. You have to have that time period and action plan as we all know to get things rolling. So um so I guess just to conclude here, uh as far as questions go if people this this um, this interview is going to be shared like I mentioned earlier and I'm sure we're going to see uh, opinions and questions and concerns and things come up so I think what we'll do is we could uh, we'll certainly field them on the spike camp platform and then I can forward them to you know start a group email and then we can post our answers back up so we'll try to keep the momentum alive with the discussions as we move forward but I guess if uh, if membership wants to reach out to either of you direct, I guess, Bill, what's the best way to, to get in touch with you in the future? Or what's your preferred method if people want to, to reach out? Yeah, well, probably email um, is the best one because it's always there, right? So you turn on the computer and it's waiting there for you sort of thing. Um, but recognizing that there's there's a lot of emails that come. so. Sometimes I'm not able to get back to people right away. And as long as people are patient that way, then then know that, that it's at least there anyways. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the other the other opportunity, as Kyle sort of touched on, is is part of those larger engagement opportunities that happen, you know, like tonight. You know, here we are talking about different ideas, spitballing ideas. You know, any question is open. Um, there's a lot of that opportunity that's sort of being created by the society and you know the wildlife fed and GOABC within their stakeholder groups as well. So if people are members of those, then plug into those conversations and then you're, you know, those usually come as a compendium or a, a suite of uh, uh, discussion points. So there's two kind of ways there. One on one sometimes works well and and sometimes it's good to be connected and coordinated because you might frame a question a certain way someone else might have a, a very similar question but they're framing it slightly different and just make sure they're harmonized so that you get the answer that that works right excellent and we all know how to find kyle he's not a hard guy to find at all <laughs> well guys uh you know on behalf of spike camp i just want to thank you both for uh for taking the time tonight. This was a, a great session. The uh, presentation bill is was really well done and really well laid out. And, you know, as a member of Wild Sheep Society, member of Spike Camp, and as a, a sheep hunter, um, I certainly feel a lot better about my decisions going forward. So, and Kyle, thank you as always. I think we're gonna put a, we're gonna put a, uh, 
uh, pin in this one and call it a night. And we are going to have uh, our second segment tomorrow night at seven o'clock, same time. We've got uh, an old friend, Kyle, you know him, I know him. Mr. Uh, Kevin Willis is going to be on to talk about ultralight sheep hunting. And we're going to do a Q&A and see if we can put him on the spot tomorrow night. So once again, thanks, guys. Uh, great session. And I look forward to talking to you soon.